I'm David Webb in for Laura Ingram, and this is a special edition of the Ingram Angle DC Dysfunction. Like so many other purported bombshells, the BuzzFeed's latest claiming that the president directed his former attorney, Michael Cohen, to lie to Congress hit a wall tonight. For much of the past 24 hours, the breathless coverage has sounded like this. This is probably one of the most serious pieces of reporting in the, you know, two plus years of this uh, of this Russia investigation. The question of impeachment seems to now be a question of timing. There's a very strong argument to be made that this is a high crime or misdemeanor for which impeachment may be a possibility. Obstruction of justice and perjury to Congress are uh, right there in the heart of impeachment territory. Historically, it's a beeline to impeachment, right? Uh, Michael Cohen once again puts another nail in that coffin for this president. And just this morning, the lead reporter on the case was saying this. How confident are you that they actually exist, that this is true? I don't think that we said that we haven't seen them. Uh, but I will say that I'm very confident well, uh, that they your exist. Colleague 100%. Tonight, special counsel Bob Mueller's office took the very, very rare step of publicly commenting on the story. For the latest details, we're joined now by Trace Gallagher, live in our West Coast newsroom. Trace? Good evening, David. Robert Mueller, special counsel, as you said, has issued statements about as often as Haley's comet flies by. So clearly, Team Mueller felt an urgency to quickly knock this down, saying, and I'm quoting here, BuzzFeed's description of specific statements to the special counsel's office and characterization of documents and testimony obtained by this office regarding Michael Cohen's congressional testimony are not accurate. That's critical because BuzzFeed literally laid this at the door of the special counsel, saying, quote, the special Special counsel's office learned about Trump's directive for Cohen to lie to Congress through interviews with multiple witnesses from the Trump organization and internal company emails, text messages, and a cache of other documents. But one of the reporters who wrote the piece admitted he never saw the alleged damning documents. But he did say the special counsel is the one who brought this to Michael Cohen. Watch him. It's our understanding that presented this to him uh, or, or began asking questions based off of it. Then he acknowledged in his interview, yes, indeed, I was directed by the president. Yeah, tonight BuzzFeed is saying, quote, we stand by our reporting and the sources who informed it, and we urge the special counsel to make clear what he's disputing. And tonight the editor-in-chief of BuzzFeed was on CNN. Listen. I do think what they did here is just extremely confusing. Confusing. In what way? To all of us. I mean, be confusing in that it's not clear that, you know, a day after a story is published, they come out with this very, both a very detailed and very opaque statement disputing it. Meantime, Michael Cohen isn't commenting, but earlier, Cohen's legal advisor, Lanny Davis, was steering clear of BuzzFeed altogether. Watch. Mr. Cohen and myself uh, neither deny nor confirm. We're just not commenting on the story. And I'm adding today another comment. He had nothing to do with the writing of the story. He didn't initiate the story. It was done by independent reporting. So the story stands on its own. And BuzzFeed has long had credibility issues, including multiple accusations of plagiarizing and stealing original content. BuzzFeed also published the uncorroborated and salacious steel dossier, which was labeled an unverified smear of President Trump. And Jason Leopold, the other reporter who wrote this piece, is the same person who back in 2006 wrote that then Deputy Chief of Staff Carl Rove had been indicted by a grand jury. Here's Carl. This is a sensational story, if true, problematic, but anything that has Jason Leopold's name on it, mm -hmm. I, I, particularly when it is anonymous sources, uh, it, it strikes me as, as something we ought to wait uh, and, and, and make a judgment about later. Even Democrats eager to impeach the president had qualified their comments earlier saying if the information is true, which apparently it is not. And 24 hours after BuzzFeed ran the story, nobody, not a single media outlet matched their reporting. And now we know why. David. Trace, thanks. Great reporting. Joining me now, Wisconsin Congressman Sean Duffy. 
Kimberly Strassel, member of the Wall Street Journal editorial board and a, board and a Fox News contributor, and David Morey, former advisor to Barack Obama's 2008 presidential campaign. You know, David, let me go to you first on this. This is a track record of problematic reporting, and it was the breathless reporting by many on the left, the, the congressmen, the pundits today, national security analysts on networks, all ready for impeachment, and here we are. Yeah, David, so what I, would say, I would say that, uh, you know, earlier today I was telling the Fox on, uh, the folks on MSNBC to slow down. I would tell, say to the friends at, uh, on Fox News to slow down as well. This is a cautionary tale. We've got a long way to go here to see what Robert Mueller has and doesn't have. Uh, remember the, uh, the reporting from Ben Smith. Uh, the editor BuzzFeed said, BuzzFeed said uh, we're going to stay tuned. We're going to re-report the story. Let's see, as Trey said, no other independent journalist uh, outlets have been able to car corroborate the story. Let's see if they're able to do so as we dig deeper here. I suspect one of the reasons that finally the Mueller team said something is they're concerned a little more about the sourcing than the substance. There was an illusion that Mueller's team talked, and that may not be the case. These two independent sources that are quoted in the article may be something not attached to the Mueller team. I would make one more quick point. The Southern District has been much more aggressive at talking about what the president did or didn't or possibly directed versus the Mueller team. This really underlines we all better wait for the Mueller report to come out. That's the pivot point here. Well, David. Kimberly, to you, they have not been waiting. The breathless reporting, the end result, right. and then rarely a retraction. Yeah, I only so, wish people were waiting. Uh, you know, look, we're, I'm still waiting for Adam Schiff. Two years ago, he claimed that the committee that he's on in Congress had uh, definitive proof that Trump engaged in collusion. We've still yet to see it. We've got McClatchy reporters out there claiming that Michael Cohen was in Prague, even though Michael Cohen says he never had been there. And the special counsel's documents suggest they found no evidence that he ever was. So, yeah, it would be great if people slowed down. But look, why did everyone jump on this? I think this is important. The reason people got breathless is because there were claims in the story that there was text messages and evidence, something that went beyond Michael Cohen's word. Um, also, the belief that this was a new bite at the obstruction apple, given that the whole hope that they could get Trump on obstruction for firing Comey doesn't seem to be panning out. So that's, I think, what inspired everyone latching onto this. But cautionary tale indeed why don't we just sit tight and wait and see what bob Mueller has to say that would be a great wish kimberly and i wish people would wait by the way the president just tweeting about this and sean react to this the president tweeting remember it was buzzfeed that released the totally discredited dossier paid for by crooked hillary clinton and the democrats as opposition research in parentheses on which the entire Russia probe is based. A very sad day for journalism, but a great day for our country. Sean, you're down there on the hill yeah. and you've seen this play out. Respond to the president's yes. tweet. So, so, David, I don't know that a lot of your viewers actually go to BuzzFeed and see what's on this website. So they run these uh, salacious articles uh, and they turn out not to be true. But that's not all they run. Just a few headlines uh, from, uh, from today, David, on, on BuzzFeed. They have a, a, a posting that says 14 dogs from this week you'll treasure forever. Another one, 20 cats from this week who grace the Internet with their presence. And a third one, 19 absolutely beautifully poached eggs I literally want to marry. That's what you get from BuzzFeed, and that's who CNN, MSNBC, and all the other outlets are sourcing and running all day long about how Donald Trump, if true, is going to be impeached. The bottom line is the left-wing media, they love this stuff because they want to impeach Donald Trump. They hate his voters. Right, so they hate Kimberly, him. If they can't impeach him, what they're going to do is make sure he doesn't get reelected re in 2020. So, Kimberly and David, I'm going to get back to you on the delegitimization of President Trump approach. But, Kimberly, is BuzzFeed really about clickbait then, whether it's true or not, unsourced, unnamed sources? Well, this is a problem I think a lot of the journalism industry has, and it goes all the way back to even before Donald Trump came in. I think the journalism sector has 
really lowered the bar on what used to be basic standards. Uh, even going so far, sometimes when they would say they were anonymous sources, they would at least say, for instance, what branch they belonged to, what department they were talking to, whether or not these were retired officials that they were speaking to or current officials. Now we just get, according to officials, we don't know who, what, where, are they officials at the DMV? Uh, or maybe they are officials at the, at the Justice Department. Maybe they've been out of politics for 10 years. We don't know, and it really does diminish the ability for people to uh, judge the credibility of stories. One other really important but thing, too, about journalism... do they care about, about credibility, David, to Kimberly's point? Do they care about credibility? Yeah, I think people are searching and hungering for credibility. They're looking for where they can get some truth. And uh, there's examples on the far left and the far right of not finding that truth, of spinning. And we just have to be diligent. I think this is a, a rough day for journalism. Let's see how it all plays out over the long term. It's a call to go even higher in their standards, to double, triple check multiple sources. Uh, we all have our favorite places to go to get truth. They all got to step up the game. I would say we got to slow down and not celebrate and wait for Mueller's report to come out. And when it comes to Bob Mueller, I don't want to tell him what to do, but he should speed up. Let's get this thing going here. All right, so, Sean, there have been requests for speeding up, reports, requests, FISA. I mean, there has been FOIA activity in Washington related to all of right. this, but yet we're two years plus into this. And, and I agree with David. I mean, listen, let, let's get let's get this uh, investigation done. Let's get the report out and let's have the media pump the brakes a little bit and be a little more cautious on the reporting. I think that would serve the media better and the American people better. But I think the, the, the message from what happened today is there will be more fake mainstream media stories out about Donald Trump. And my fear is that if, if Bob Mueller now doesn't come out and discredit those stories, then the left wing media will say, see, David, it must be true because Bob Mueller didn't discredit. And I think that's the, 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 the game play moving forward. All right. So, Kimberly, back to you, because now Chris Cuomo, speaking of the media, now on CNN tonight, saying that Bob Mueller did a disservice to this. So where does this go from here? Well, that's new criticism of Bob Mueller. <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, I mean the Democrats going to throw Bob Mueller under the bus and attack him. No, look, here's what this highlights, and I think it, it gets to the. We need to wrap this up, okay? This has become, in my view, a lot of what's happened in special counsel's probe has been very disruptive and problematic. But the longer it goes on, and now with Democrats in Congress, and look, that's a fundamental and important change in dynamics. Because I have no doubt that one reason Bob Mueller decided he needed to issue a statement is because Democrats immediately said they were going to investigate this. Um, and that's a serious question. So that's going to continue every time there's another one of these unsourced stories. Here's my hope that Bill Barr comes in as the attorney general and he sets a deadline. He doesn't say he's going to impede. He doesn't say, you know, you can't do this or that. But he's going to say, look, this needs to be finished by this date. Date certain. Let's finish this up and move on. Well, we can all hope for that, but I don't know if we're going to ever see it. Sean, Kimberly, David. Thank you. This is thank just you. the beginning of the next cycle. Panel, thank you. Now, thank I you. want to drill down on one of the authors in this piece, Jason Leopold. You heard what we played earlier, that he's confident this bombshell, in quotes, bombshell report was true and even BuzzFeed stood by him. Jason is one of the best journalists in the world, and he has proven it. BuzzFeed News stands by this story 100%. Oops, you probably want to walk that back now. BuzzFeed was wish casting so hard on this story, but before coming out with that statement, they should have checked into his troubled past of making up sources. It goes all the way back to the Bush administration and his work then. His problems were so bad, even the Columbia Journalism Review, recognized and respected, once accused Leopold of being a fabulist. One of the targets of his shoddy reporting, former George W. Bush advisor Karl Rove, sounded off earlier today to my colleague Dana Perino. Jason Leopold uh, wrote a story for BuzzFeed saying that I had been indicted by a grand jury. He recreated a tearful moment in the Oval Office in which I told President Bush that I was about ready to be indicted, said that I told members of the White House staff that I was going to soon be indicted, and, uh, and all heck broke loose. It was simply not true. There was not a, a element of truth in it, either as to the indictment, to the grand jury, to the meeting with the president, you name it.
Now, here's a guy I trust in media, and he's here to break it down for us. Media reporter and columnist for The Hill, Joe Concha. Joe, uh, clickbait is what I'm calling it. Where does BuzzFeed go from this? It's a huge blow. Or is it a huge blow? I don't yeah, David, I don't see how they get out uh, up from the 10 count off the mat, to use a boxing term, because not only now do you have the special counsel who never has weighed in on any news report up until now refuting this story, but even Ronan Farrow said, yeah, I thought about going down this road, but given the source that BuzzFeed appeared to have used here, I walked away from the story. Then even the New York Times said that their sources tell them that Donald Trump never instructed never instructed Michael Cohen to lie uh, in this situation. So it really is falling apart at this point. You know what the tell was for me, David? Early today, and you played the clip before, where you had Anthony Cormier, who is a, a solid reporter by, by all accounts, telling CNN that he didn't see the damning evidence that was used in the story. And then you have Jason Leopold on MSNBC telling Hallie Jackson that Oh, no, no, no. We've seen the evidence. In other words, the two reporters on it saw it. <clears throat> so, excuse me. So somebody is lying here, obviously. And, and now it's all falling apart. And, and look, another, another tell as well. Law enforcement officials in the story said they were involved in an investigation, as was pointed out by Anthony McCarthy earlier on Tucker Carlson's show, meaning maybe not the Russian investigation, but some other investigation. To Kimberly's point, we don't know who these law enforcement officials are. Are they at the top of the ring? Are they outside the loop? We don't know. So again, it's a matter of being first instead of accurate and treating gossip as gospel. And now here we are once again, one of the biggest black eyes that we've seen in journalism. And this reminds me a lot, David, of the Michael Flynn story by AB, then ABC News reporter, investigative reporter Brian Ross, using one source saying that Donald Trump during the campaign had directed Flynn to reach out to the Russians. Brian Ross is no longer with ABC. Boy, this feels a lot like that, David. Yeah, but Joe, it keeps repeating. And over the years, you've talked about this. We've covered these issues across the spectrum and it keeps happening. So is there a lesson not being learned here or is this really so badly aligned against Donald Trump that they will put anything out there knowing that they will feed the beast? Well, that's the thing. Whenever these mistakes are made, they always seem to go in one direction, don't they, David? They're always negative towards this administration. You never see any positive mistakes, for instance, being made about the Trump administration or this president. I'll, I'll leave you with this. Axios and SurveyMonkey, 65% in this poll said that fake news is usually reported because, quote, people have an agenda. That's what the American people think. Two out of three think that fake news is reported because people have an agenda. 3% think it happens just by accident. So the public perception of media, not just Republicans, but the American people in general outside of the rabid partisans, think that the news reporters are not only just making mistakes and being sloppy, but actually have an agenda and are making things up. It's incredible. And by the way, David, congratulations to you, by the way, to getting the, the guest hosting spot tonight, despite being the benefit of white privilege. I mean, I think that that's remarkable. <laughs> but here you are sitting here as a beneficiary of white you know, privilege. By the way, for the record, Joe, was one of the first people to hear that story when that happened on my show. I know you got a call from our mutual friend, Dave. We'll see what yes. they do with it, Joe. Always good to talk to you. I'll, I'll reveal the source. Uh, I went to high school with our mutual friend, Dave. So there you go. And he's my boss. So there you go. Now we've reported properly on my white privilege. Transparency. All right, coming up. See, the, it isn't hard. The, <laughs> Yeah, we need a laugh in this environment, folks. Coming up, the war of words between Donald Trump and Nancy Pelosi intensifies. What she accused the president of, that's next. Plus, a live report from inside Mexico is the Guatemalan caravan, which has been gaining ground and gaining people, gained easy access to the country. That and more when this special edition of Ingram Angle continues. Without a strong border, America is defenseless, vulnerable, and unprotected. After the president pulled the plug on her overseas trip, you know, the one where you, the taxpayers, were footing the bill for them, Pelosi and the other Democrats, well, they decided to fly commercial. Plans for that trip were allegedly leaked to the media, and Pelosi is now blaming the White House. I know you're shocked. Yes, the Speaker of the House actually accusing the president of the United States of endangering a group of congressmen. It's unreal. you got to watch this.
We had a report from Afghanistan that the president um, outing our trip had made the scene on the ground much more dangerous because it's just a signal to the bad actors that were coming. To make that type of accusation, it is outrageous uh, that she would accuse the president of the United States of putting any life in jeopardy. In fact, the reason he didn't want her to go is because he's trying to protect American citizens. All right, now joining me, nationally syndicated columnist Adriana Cohen and Democratic strategist Scott Levinson. Scott, how can Pelosi possibly, possibly make this claim without having the evidence to back it up? Well, she says very clearly she was told by folks in Afghanistan that this was the case. What I'm unclear about is are we not sure that the president is being petty? Are we not sure that he's being unpresidential, both of which he proves every day? Or are we not sure that he's putting Americans in harm's way? There's clearly his statements from, about ISIS in the previous weeks put Americans in harm's way. So he has a habit of misstating, speaking off the cuff, in ways that endanger Americans. This wasn't so a So isn't junket. she being a little just bit petty, Scott, by, actually, her, by her statement? I actually think what's remarkable is that no one goes to Afghanistan to have a good time. No one goes to Afghanistan on some kind of political junket. So to frame this as if it's some kind of taxpayer boondoggle is silly. These are congressional delegates going to learn about what's going on in Afghanistan. That should be respected for what it is. All right, so for the record, and I think a lot of people in the audience know this, I've been to Afghanistan on official trips. I went there in 2013. I went through military, so I landed at Bagram. She would have landed at Kabul airport, and I spent time on that flight line with the Air Force team that was building at the 15-nation team led by General Michelle. So I know the airport. Also, when you book that many commercial flights, Adriana, when you do that, it is public knowledge. There's nothing to lead. People just have to leak. People just have to put in their common sense. So tit for tat, petty. She's accusing the president of being petty, but... This is not information that's being hidden or secure when you book that many commercial. Absolutely. I mean, Steve, are you kidding me? Do you actually Scott. think that the American people wouldn't notice that all these high-ranking Democrats disappeared during the government shutdown? But I mean, you've got to be kidding me. Obviously, kidding the American I mean, people would know that, the that this happened. Of the House, so wait a second. Who knew? Did you know? Before the president said anything, did you know? So clearly, well, let, let her her point. Point. if they, her took, this trip, she, she if they took this trip, the American Scott, people sorry, would have known okay. about it. And here's what I know is that Nancy Pelosi's number one responsibility is to the American people and it's to keep our citizens Correct. safe. It is not the time for her to be jetting off overseas during a government I'm shutdown with 800,000 American workers our 800 American workers are not getting paid. She should be securing the border, stopping drugs from coming in. How about we end uh, the yeah, shutdown? Hotels, if you're that concerned about the 800,000 workers, why don't we just okay, end the so shutdown? Okay, to so that, to that point, Steve, to that Scott. point, how do you end the shutdown if you don't stay in Washington and do the work? Now, put aside the tit-for-tat and the pettiness, whatever anyone wants to call it. Nancy Pelosi, a congressional delegation, by the way, all their staffers are being paid. The White House employees, a lot of them are already furloughed. So that's a difference going on right there. So the, the congressmen and senators have their full staffs, full budgets. So they're not in Washington doing the work while saying they're concerned about the people being furloughed. But it's clear. So how I'm do you sorry, reconcile that with her actions? Because it's just disingenuous. When the president created a crisis on the southern border that never existed in the first place, that led how to How did he manufacture that, the crisis? Because there is no crisis on the southern border. It doesn't exist. It's a myth. Are you kidding me? No one is hiding so under 60, that table. Uh, hang on, hang on. Let, me go to, let me go to Adriana on this because the numbers tell a different story. 60,000 people over the last three months, an increase, significant increase but in every children being security, brought here. All security personnel speak to the other border crossings as being more porous than our southern border. So why don't we look at a comprehensive way of dealing with undocumented workers so, crossing so let, me, let me ask you Not this if, if walls don't exist. work hang on hang on okay. if walls don't work 
Where is the Democrat calling for taking down the existing wall? Then I want to go to Adrian. Well, we are Where's the Democrat? If they don't work, why don't you want to take down the existing wall? Because walls? what we actually are talking about is a comprehensive approach to immigration, a path to citizenship. That's what's required, not this demagogy that's going on out of the White House about... All right, I've got to get a quick one from, uh, from Adriana so I can wrap this. Uh, put aside yeah, all of these other issues, go back to where we were. It's not a manufacturer crisis. I trust our Border Patrol. I trust ICE. I, they're all patriots. They're telling Correct. politicians, we need help. We need the wall. Correct. We need increased security. So this is not coming from, you know, out of thin air. This is from the people on the ground who risk their lives who for this country every single day. all say there are other border day. crossings and, that are more porous. Every one of them say look, that. All right, guys, I've got, look, I've got to wrap it here. Like Congress, this is not going to be resolved anytime uh, soon. But, Scott, Adrian, I want to thank you. Sorry about thank mixing you. your name up there, the no, passion please. of the moment. No, of course. Thank you both, panel. Uh, I thought Mexico was supposed to help us stop these dangerous migrant caravans before they get to the U.S. border. Matter of fact, Olga Sanchez Cordero, their interior minister, said they were going to do that. Well, I guess not. Take a look at this video. 1,000 migrants just walking across the border from Guatemala into Mexico after the gates were left wide open. Fox's Steve Harrigan is in Tapachula, Mexico with the latest. Steve? David, this is what it looks like when the caravan comes to your town. We're about 10 miles over that border and just in the pre-dawn hours, as you explained, that border inexplicably left wide open, about a thousand migrants crossing with no check of their documents whatsoever. That situation changed after a short time. Documents were being checked. The migrants were given wristbands and told they have to wait five days for a visa to Mexico. But keep in mind, this border is still wide open for the caravan, even after that five-day wait. The president of Mexico, a leftist, Lopez Obrador, has said these people will be treated humanely. And when you talk to them, really, the main goal is not to stay here in Mexico, but to keep going on to the U.S. That's where they want to go. When you talk to them almost to a person, they'll say, we'll get there to the U.S. to work whether it's legal or illegally, for many, it's a sense they can't go back again. They do not intend to go back. And keep in mind, this is the second major caravan. The first one had 7,000. This one has about 2,000 spread out, and it's not the last one. Already, even as we speak, two more caravans are coming. They're being formed right now in Honduras. So while the Mexican president says we're going to treat you humanely, you could get a sense that the people of Mexico, you see what happens to small towns like this when suddenly you have a thousand people sleeping on the street. This is the second time here, and it's going to happen again and again in these small Mexican towns as these caravans continue to march forward to the U.S. border. David, back to you. Steve, thanks for that report. Now here with his reaction, Hector Garza. A Garza, a Border Patrol agent and vice president of the National Border Patrol Council. Hector, it's been a while. Great to talk to you again here on the Ingram Angle. You know, what Steve just said about what happens in the march to the towns, to the localities, that's rarely covered on this network we do, but they don't talk about the effect of this march on all the people they pass by and those neighborhoods. Well, you have to think about that. We have this caravan that's coming uh, uh, through Mexico right now. We have more caravans that, that are forming in Central America. But let's not forget that we've been seeing a silent caravan coming through South Texas. Uh, our agents are apprehending anywhere from 500 to 1,000 illegal aliens that are coming into this country. Now, uh, we just saw it a couple of days ago uh, in the Yuma sector where uh, three Border Patrol agents came across 376 illegal aliens that crossed the border over there. So it's definitely a humanitarian crisis, and it's causing a lot of problems. Uh, not only for the, for the migrants, but for our agents and for the American public. Well, here's something that's also not talked about. Not also only the effect during the migrant march, but they're going to run into, if they go towards Tijuana, already some one to 2,000, the numbers vary, migrants that are there from the last caravan. So this is like the waves splashing up against a border that the president may well close, or if they go to someplace else, they end up with Annunciation House, they get released into the El Paso community. So this issue is just continuing to grow. What needs to be done about it now, and is Mexico going to be any help, or are they just going to pass through as usual? 
So clearly Mexico needs to do more uh, on their part in stopping these uh, people from coming through their country uh, like a free pass. You saw the, the reporters saying that the gates were wide open. So Mexico definitely needs to do something about that and, and not allow these people to come through their, through their country and encourage it to come th uh, through this country. Now, the other thing is that we need to talk about those physical barriers uh, that we've been calling for as Border Patrol agents. And I, I want to make it very clear that these physical barriers that we're calling for are barriers in strategic locations to make sure that we can help our Border Patrol agents uh, enforce the law and make sure that we can stop these type of caravans, but also the danger of drugs. Now, uh, these, uh, these uh, migrants are coming to this country because it's a clear rampant abuse of our immigration system. They know that if they just say a few key words to our border agents, they're going to try to qualify for asylum and they are going to be released into the U.S. And unfortunately, we but cannot see, keep up Hector, if I level. could just pause you there and interject, this is an important series of numbers. The $5.7 billion request, all the other things that are requested in FY 2019 by the administration, immigration judges, all the things that you guys have asked for in your report to the president, to Congress, it includes what needs to be done about the process for these migrants when they cross over into the U.S. illegally. So is that being done? Where Are we handling the, handling the flow and the flood or do we need an immediate surge? So clearly it's a national crisis, it's a humanitarian crisis that we're seeing on the border. Uh, our agents are, are undermanned. We don't have the resources to care for these people. And, and the flow is not stopping. Uh, there's some changes that need to be done at the congressional level, but, but think about it. We can't even get our government open. How, how can we expect for Congress to close the, uh, the immigration loopholes that these people are exploiting? It's just out of control. And, and, and seriously, our congressional leaders need to get their act together to make sure that we stop this. We need to stop encouraging illegal immigration, and we need to get serious about border security. Well, we certainly do need to do that. Hector Garza, Hector, great to see you again. Uh, keep your voice out there. We need your expertise and your input. President, by the way, will make a major announcement tomorrow at 3 p.m. on border security. So we'll uh, keep you updated on that right here on the channel. Stay right there. Up next, Tony Perkins and Congressman Mike Kelly from Pennsylvania's 3rd District. They join me to react to the dueling fortunes and messages at the March for Life and the Women's March when this special edition of Ingram Angle continues. The media will ignore us because they always do. They'll cover other marches, you know, the five people who show up tomorrow. Righteousness doesn't have to be popular. It just has to be righteous. Today I have signed a letter to Congress to make clear that if they send any legislation to my desk that weakens the protection of human life, I will issue a veto. Tens of thousands marching today in our nation's capital. They're there to protest the 1974 Supreme Court Roe versus Wade decision advocating for women to choose life, not abortion. But this is how the liberal media framed today's event. The Washington Post headline saying, and I quote, March for Life says it's pro-science despite medical consensus favoring abortion access. Here now to react, Tony Perkins. He's the president of the Family Research Council. And Mike Kelly, my good friend and the congressman from Pennsylvania's 3rd District. Gentlemen, great to see you both. Tony, uh, first to you, by the way, the march, the longest running march in Washington, successful Americans have a belief, a right, they exercise it, and they do so peacefully. And yet, they're attacked for their beliefs. Well, David, I'm glad uh, you didn't get your numbers from the media. I was there, and it was tens of thousands of people there. The media reports, uh, in fact, I think one of them said it was over a 1,000 people. Uh, I guess they're safe. It was uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. And you're right, it's been going on for 46 years, uh, 45 years as people show up for these uh, marches. And it, it is a message that we want to see the court reined in when it comes to the issue of life, but it's more than that. It is, it is a march to change the hearts and minds of people, which I would say we have seen tremendous progress in the last 46 years. In fact, I believe very soon we will see America once again being a predominantly pro-life nation, and despite what they say, science is on our side. Well, the headline's a bit uh disjointed, if you will, Mike, because it really isn't one reference into the other. You were there. We talked about this earlier yes. on my radio show. Uh, your observations.
You know, my observations, and you know, there are so many people that show up in Washington for many different causes. I would just suggest to somebody or anybody who has never been to the March for Life, if you want to see a stark contrast between people who love life, people who have so much peace and love in their hearts, if you were to see that group, and I'm with Mr. Perkins, there's hundreds of thousands there, and we talked about it earlier, about it being undercounted and underreported. When you look at the faces of the people who come to Washington, not in anger, not in hate, mm -hmm. but in hope that we can reverse a decision that's happened so long ago, and we keep saying, my goodness, in the United States of America, 2,500 to 3,000 abortions a day. We, we, we recoil any time we hear of any disaster around the world or loss of life. But with this, we sit back and we watch it happen. We, well, it's okay because the Supreme Court said it was okay. But I've got to tell you, it is the faces of those people that you see. All age ranges, by the way. And I was in mass this morning. I couldn't, it was just so good to sit there among a group of people who were there for the same reason, and that was pro-life. All right, so gentlemen, uh, we have the Women's March coming up. And Tamika Mallory, one of the organizers, now this is a march that has fallen apart after the obvious, the public uh, images of Linda Sarsour, the relationship to Louis Farrakhan. And Tamika Mallory, by the way, let's watch what she had to say when she was taking the task. Why call him the greatest of all time? I didn't call him the greatest of all time because of his rhetoric. I called him the greatest of all time because of what he's done in black communities. By the way, that is a reaction, and I guess you want to call it a statement, about Louis Farrakhan, one of the most hateful people in America. Tony, you know, First Amendment rights, right to advocate for your cause. But the Women's March has been violent. It has been vile. And yet they're falling apart and the March for Life isn't. You're right. Absolutely. Uh, and as Mike was saying, I, I was there at the march earlier today. I've been the last 15 years I've been at the life, uh, the March for Life. And unfortunately, one time I got caught up in the women's march. Uh, wasn't there uh, intentionally. But I will tell you, there is a stark contrast. And it's not just stark contrast in the marches and the behavior, but really in the underlying uh, ideals. And, and as Mike was saying, we're marching for life. It's hope. It's love. Uh, and and. You know, they were criticized, were criticized today because of the, the embracing of, of, of science. And the science does underscore the, the, the potential and the presence of human life. And the left, you know, they, they, they're mocking that. But the left treats the science like a smorgasbord where they can pick and choose what they want. And when it comes to babies and bathrooms, they reject science flat out. All right, Mike, uh, we've only got a few seconds left, my friend. Uh, a message to the folks out there from you. I would just say, look at the stark difference between the people and who comes to Washington, for what reasons they come to Washington. There is an incredible passion for life in this country. There always has been. David, after the, the march left the Capitol today, there were no trash uh, barrels that were upset. There was nothing on fire. There were no windows broken or doors torn off their hinges. It was a coming together of people who love life. What better? is the personification of America than that pursuit of life and happiness. It is just so much who we are. You just wonder at Mike, what point gotta, do we come, do we come to like, an thank agreement. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you. Mike, Tony, Tony thank, you. thank you both. All right, guys, thank you so thank much. You. Uh, coming up, it's not just the left pushing identity politics and tight mail and win the nomination. The obsession took on a whole new level of absurdity with the publishing of this piece from CNN's political reporter, Nia Malika Henderson. Beto's excellent adventure drips with white male privilege. Here now with reaction, Candace Owens, communications director of Turning Points USA, and Dee Dawkins Hagler, who's a former Georgia state legislator and a Democratic strategist. Ladies, uh, let's get right into it. By the way, apparently this week, I am the newest thing in white privilege, <laughs> thanks to Areva Martin, who is Kamala Harris's close confidant and friend. Candace, you and I covered something similar to this and where we are in false narratives on Fox Nation. But this is identity politics on steroids, isn't it? Absolutely. Sometimes I like to challenge myself and just switch the words black and white 
and see what you come up with. You would say that it was discriminatory. We would say that it was racist. If black men in this country were discussed in the same manner that white men are discussed today, this nation would be up in arms. There would be another civil war, and there's no question about that. But I think that this is sort of part and parcel of what the left has become. Every election cycle, they drum up this imaginary enemy, this boogeyman. Uh, I think in the 2016 election cycle, it was definitely police officers. And I think that we're seeing... It has basically had white men at the helm of all politics. And I think when you talk about... Um, identity politics. We can't just look at race. We also have to look at gender. And we know that the Democratic Party is the big tent. However, um, historically, minorities have been discriminated against, and not just in the Democratic Party, but look also in the Republican Party. In the 115th Congress, you have only one African-American serving in the United States Senate that's a Republican. I mean, we only have two in the, you know, the Democratic side, but still, even but, but the D, women, who sets I mean, the, the numbers have gone back. For this you have one of the most powerful groups in politics in this country called the Congressional Black Caucus. They're almost a protected class in Washington. They have a lot of power. Frederica Wilson, Sheila Jackson Lee, Thank Maxine you. Waters. Uh, the list goes on and you've got a new generation and Cory Booker and others. So is it really about victims?